Hi, year 12. This is Mr. Lim again, and we're going to do our fifth video on redox on displacement reactions. Okay, so this is our learning intentions and success criteria. You're going to learn about displacement reactions, what happens in one, uh, whether they're spontaneous or not based on the nature of the reactants, and then the strength or um, oxidant or reductant nature of stuff. So we'll do that later on. Okay, so displacement reactions, what are they? Displacement reactions are when ions of one substance are displaced from their ionic form, which means they're replaced or they're taken over, by substances in their elemental state. Generally, ionic substances are more stable than elemental forms due to their stable valence shell that ions possess. So most substances in elemental form then try to take or lose, depending on their nature, so that they can be in ionic form. They take or lose electrons from substances that are in ionic form already, forcing them to be in elemental form. All right, so we'll go through that process, but you can write that stuff. Okay, so the more reactive a substance is, the more likely it is to take the ionic form instead of the elemental form. All right, if a substance loses electrons to achieve ionic form, that's the metals, then the more reactive they are, the stronger their reducing potential is. If a substance, uh, so the more reactive they are, so the more reactive metals like sodium and potassium, the stronger their reducing potential is, okay? Because they are losing electrons, which is oxidation, which means that they will cause the other substance to undergo reduction, okay? And that other substance undergoing reduction might be another metal. If a substance gains electrons to, in, to achieve ionic form, i.e. non-metals, then the more reactive they are, the stronger their oxidizing potential is, all right? So that's your halogens and stuff. If they're more reactive they are, the stronger their oxidizing potential is or the ability to cause another substance to oxidize like an ion of halogen, making the ion of halogen oxidize into elemental halogen and that other halogen to turn back into a ion. So let's go through some examples. All right. So displacement reactions with metals. If you test each metal against each other metal ion, you can build a reactivity series which will rank the substances from most reactive, or if the metals are uh, strongest reducing agents, to the least reactive. And what they've done is they've done that many times, um, and this is the reactivity series that they've got here. Metals higher on the reactivity series will give electrons to metal ions lower on the reactivity series, and thus the metal at the top of the list are the strongest reducing agents. So strongest reducing agents, potassium, sodium, lithium, right? Um, and the metals, if you have a metal, so say, say you have potassium metal added to zinc ions, okay? If you have potassium metal, which is here, added to zinc ions here, then the potassium has the ability to force the zinc ions to take its electrons and turn the zinc into metal and the potassium into ions, all right? So that's, the, uh, that's what we're talking about. This potassium here forces its electrons onto this zinc, making it turn into zinc um, metal, solid, and then the potassium gets to be in ionic form, which it wants to be in. All right? So, um, for metal displacement reactions, the ions of metal will be turned into elemental metal on the surface of the original metal, and atoms of the original metal will be turned into ions and enter solution. Okay, so let's go back to that potassium and um, uh, potassium and zinc Example. Okay, so here's potassium. Here's zinc. All right. Um, here is your here is your beaker full of zinc two plus ions. Here is your block of potassium. Okay, you put that inside there, and that thing will you know sink to the bottom, or maybe just kind of float on the on the surface. Let's just have it half floating in the thing. Okay, right. So now it's half floating in the surface, right? So the electrons are going from the potassium. Let's turn that into a different color. The electrons are going from the potassium to these zinc ions. And the zinc ions, when they collide with them, are going to form a 
surface layer of zinc atoms on the surface of that potassium, All right? And those potassiums that get to change electrons, they get to go into solution and form K plus ions. Okay? So that's what they're doing. All right? The electrons from the metals have been transferred uh, from the metal to the ions. And the electrons have been directly transferred from atom to ion. So that's directly when they collide with each other. Right, and so the idea is that the new the ions that are in solution will coat the uh, solid that's there. All right, so here's an example: your sodium, all right, which is up here, is much more reactive than the copper, which is all the way down here. So therefore, when you add some sodium into some copper solution, the sodium will turn into sodium ions, and the copper will end up as copper solid. All right. Um, the sodium has undergone oxidation, forcing and losing its electrons, forcing those electrons onto the copper, um, and this one has undergone reduction. Okay, so let's have a look. The, uh, this is an exam question. Tin is a metallic element located in group 14 of the periodic table. It's used to make many different uh, alloys such as bronze and solder, blah, 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 blah. Chemistry student has one mole per liter solution of the four following substances, those four there. Which of these solutions could not be stored in a tin container? Okay, so you've got tin, SN, okay? It's the solid, it's the container. And then you've got all of these ions here that you're going to try and put into it. And why can't you store it? Because if um, if this is going to react with the tin container, it's going to cause holes in the tin container, and then you're going to have problems. Or it's just going to react, and that's just not going to be bad. Okay? Not going to be good. So let's have a look. Where is tin on this list? There. All right? Where is nickel on this list? Nickel is here. Zinc is here. Lead is here. And magnesium is here. All right? Now immediately you see that one of them is the odd one out. Why? It's the lead, which is below the tin. So what's going to happen is that, remember, the higher it is up on this one, on this list, the metal will cause the ion to displace and therefore enter solution. So what's going to happen here is that you have your tin container, okay, which is made up of tin atoms, atoms of tin. Okay, if you put in your lead here, your lead is going to coat this as the electrons from these go, from these tin atoms go to the uh, lead. Because the tin is sufficiently a strong enough uh, uh, reducing agent to reduce the lead from Pb2 plus to Pb uh, solid, all right? So that's what it's talking about. It's saying which one of these can and cannot. It's the lead because it will react with the tin and effectively make that tin container useless, all right? Um, when it says uh, explain your answer using the relevant chemical equations, you would need to show the relevant half equations. So what would that be? Sn goes to Sn2 plus Aq plus 2e minus solid here and then the lead one would be the pb2 plus goes to pb solid and you'd need some electrons over here and then you could combine them if you really wanted to okay and that would be uh if you had this reactivity series and there is a different reactivity series that we'll actually use later on but the concept is you use this data to tell you whether that reaction will occur okay so the same applies with the halogens. If you test each halogen against a halogen ion or the halide ion, you can build a reactivity series which will rank the substances from most reactive to the least reactive. Halogens higher on the reactivity series will take electrons from halide ions lower on the reactivity series. Okay, so CO2 gas will take electrons from Br minus. Okay. So those electrons will transfer, right? And they'll end up 
like Cl minus, oops, supposed to be green, Cl minus, and this one will end up as Br2. Okay, so these will take electrons because they're halogens, they have high electronegativity, right? They'll take electrons rather than give them that the metals do, right? And remember that all halogens are diatomic molecules in their elemental form. So F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, that kind of stuff. Okay. So the ion of the halogen will turn into elemental halogens, usually dissolved in the solution. And the atoms of the molecules of the original halogen, usually dissolved in the solution again, will be turned into ions and enter the solution. Okay. So what that means here is that they're usually dissolved in the solution uh, means is that you can have Cl2 or any halogen AQ which is sometimes called or it's called chlorine water you can have chlorine gas and you can have chloride ions So you've got to read the question carefully and says, okay, well, are you adding chlorine water or chlorine gas to this substance? Like it won't make a difference in terms of what reaction will occur, but it will make a difference when you're doing observations later on. Okay. The electrons from the halide ion have been transferred to the elemental halogen and it occurs again directly um, as they collide with each other. Okay. The atoms of halogens have been reduced and the halide ions have been oxidized. Okay. So here the Cl2 has, uh, where, where are the electrons? The electrons are with the I minus and they have been taken by the chlorine. If it, since that's the gain in electrons, that's reduction. And this one here has lost some electrons and so therefore this is oxidation, right? Because the electrons have been transferred from that halide ion, halide ion, right? to the elemental halogen, the elemental halogen, right? And see there, see there, that AQ, that means it's chlorine water. Okay, so the electrons are transferred. So which of the halogen displacements would not occur under standard conditions? So you look here, okay, let's have a look. Chlorine uh, AQ with bromine AQ, okay? So chlorine, so the higher the element, the elemental one, the higher it is on this thing, the more it will react or pull electrons and therefore it will take electrons from anything below it. So chlorine will take take electrons from bromine, iodine and astatine. All right. So will this reaction occur? Yes, it will. Because the chlorine, the elemental form is higher than the bromine. Okay. But remember, the question says which one will not occur, so we have to find out. Iodine here and bromine here. Iodine is lower than the bromine, so that won't occur, so let's just check the others. Chlorine as your elemental form and the iodine as your ionic form, so yes, that will occur. And then your bromine and your iodine. This is the elemental form and this is your ionic form, so yes, that will occur. Okay. Um, so that's the answer B. And then the next one, which of the following would have no halogen displacement occurring? So let's have a look. Okay, so Br2 here, the elemental form, and NaCl, the ionic form. Okay, so that's not going to occur. That not going to occur. Br2 aqueous, the elemental form, and the I minus, the ionic form. Okay, that's sodium iodide. Ionic forms so that will occur, but let's just check the others. Okay. Chlorine, elemental form, and bromine, um, the ionic form. So, yes, that will occur. And then chlorine and iodide. Okay, the elemental form, the ionic form. So, yes, that will occur. And so, therefore, the correct answer is A. Okay, so 
That's the concept of displacement reactions. You need to have these reactivity series, but we are going to have a different reactivity series uh, that we'll use um, later on to work out these displacement reactions. But the idea is that you, one, either a metal takes away from a non, uh, another metal, and they, uh, the, or the halogens, sorry, the metal atom gives away the electrons to the metal ions, or the halogen atoms take away electrons from the halide ions. All right, so that's the concept. You can rewatch it again and then have a go at these questions without seeing them, and then only ask any questions you have later on. All right, that's it.